I'm excited to be able to introduce our speakers for today, uh, Michael and, and Kim Hewitt and their family. I uh, had a chance to meet Mike uh, about about six months ago or so. We actually met in Orlando, Florida. We were at a, uh, uh, a supper together, and uh, Dr. Gorbett, our district superintendent, introduced Mike and said, hey, this is uh, the guy that's going to be planting a church in Muncie, Indiana. And uh, over the last few months, we've had a chance to talk some more and hear their heart uh, and their passion for the community of Muncie and for what God is doing. Um, and, and just out of purely, you know, a side note, if you've ever thought like, hey, if I could name a church, like you, you think you have the perfect name for a church, something creative and something unique, if you have that, make sure you tell them, all right? Because right now, there's still Muncie's newest church. Dot org, yeah. dot org. Um, and you can go to their website and you can you can make suggestions they're trying to figure out they're just they're just starting this journey uh, of answering God's call and getting on the ground in Muncie and and figuring out what a church looks like but I'm excited uh, I'm excited for us as a church family to partner with them as individuals we're, we're continuing to, to be challenged to look outside of ourselves and as a church we need to be challenged to continue to look outside of ourselves and so uh, over the next months and years to come, we want to partner with them. We want to journey with them through this, uh, this, this calling that God has put on them, this mission. And uh, excited to just kind of have them share today with uh, what that journey looks like and then also bring God's word. So welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Well, good morning. We are truly here, well, not just in Indiana, but here as well on a mission. And I want to introduce us to you just so you kind of know who's talking to you. It's really hard with six kids to sneak in any place. So, so I'm just going to go ahead and lay it all out there. And, and you've got six kids too? I understand. <laughs> you, you six and these six are going to have to talk after service. So my husband, Michael, has been um, a pastor in the ministry for over 20 years. He's been a youth pastor. He's been an outreach pastor and, of course, now a church planner. Um, we planted a church back in Michigan, and so we're here doing this for the second time, just waiting to see what God is going to do. Um, I usually do the music end of our partnership, so enjoyed worshiping with your praise team. And, of course, I'm sitting there going, okay, so the mix is really good, and, oh, they're using an amp for the bass instead of, so worship team, you did an awesome job. You guys appreciate your worship teams, right? Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Um, our six kids are seated over here. You guys want to stand up real quick? Brienne is a freshman at Indiana Wesleyan studying music. Kaylin is a junior in high school. Andrew at the end of the row is an eighth grader. Caleb is a sixth grader. And um, our two littlest ones are downstairs enjoying kids ministry. We've got a fourth grader and a second grader. So um, our, our second grader was down there first service and she wanted to go back. She said it was a lot of fun. So your children's ministry volunteers are doing great too. So why come to Muncie? Why move from Michigan and come down to Muncie? Well, when Pastor Mark Gorvett, your district superintendent, was talking to the zone pastors in Muncie, they, he asked them, where should we plant a church in your zone? And apparently the first three answers were Muncie, Muncie, and Muncie because they recognize that the need is so great. And what is that need? In Delaware County, there are about 110,000 people and if you look at the stats online, who's reported going to all the different churches that are in that county, over 80,000 of those people claim no religious affiliation whatsoever. And we are there to help reach those 80,000. That is our mission. So it's, sometimes it feels like it's one of those covert ops, you know, where you kind of get the information you need to know as you're going. It feels very much like that. So if you ever feel like you're not quite sure what mission God has you on, we understand. We've been there, too. Um, we know that God's on the move. We've been visiting some of the young churches in town. It's exciting to see what he's doing. But we know that the need is so great that we're hoping to become the first of many um, churches that are planted in that area. We have had around 40 people, give or take, show up for our meetings. It just kind of depends on the week. Um, we've got some of those here. I know I didn't ask you guys about this, but if you guys could stand the Loves family and David and Carolyn in the back, the Costellos, maybe they'll wave. You want to wave? <laughs> they'll stand. Awesome. They are here. Pl they are planning the church with us. Isn't that exciting? So we have people that are on board. 
and we are actually meeting in the campus of Northview Wesleyan Church that is closed, and the exciting thing is that the 12, 15 people or so that were left from that church, they are on board, and they are excited to see what God does next, and then we've got some new families that have been coming in, and it just warms my heart to see one of my boys at one of our last meetings was playing ping pong with Jack, who's around 80, I think, and used to be an art teacher at high school, and they're just playing ping pong together and enjoying each other. And I'm like, you know, we've got to do this well. We can have multi-generations right from the very beginning in our church plant. And I'm excited about that. So we're excited to see what God's going to do with these people he's got on board. Um, we are still choosing a name. So if you've got some suggestions, we're kind of narrowing it down. We have a meeting this afternoon. But if you've got some suggestions for that, you know, you can check out the ones that are listed on our web page and add your own ideas. Um, we are updating our church building, so if any of you have any skills that fall along those lines, like electric work, plumbing, anything, we would be <laughs> grateful for your help. We're going to be having work days. Um, our sanctuary needs some work. Our kids' ministry needs some work. We need to move a bathroom from one side of the hallway to the other, so we are going to need all the help we can get if you'd like to come in and join us for that. We have a big praise because we discovered under all the wood siding in the sanctuary, there's actually drywall. So that saved us. Hey, we got the Bradfords back there too. Hi, guys. <laughs> Yay, sorry I didn't see you. We got lots of people from our church. This is exciting. So um, we're going to be doing a lot of work. We would love to have you join us on that. We've got two main jobs right now in our church plant. We are meeting people and we are raising support. And you think, okay, the meeting people, that's not really a huge job. Well, it is when you look at it from the perspective of every time you meet someone, that person is either someone that needs to come to know Christ or someone that could be a friend because we just moved into town or someone that's going to be a great connection for us and might be excited about the work that's happening. So every conversation we go into, I, I'm at Aldi's and someone asked me where something is and I say, I don't know, we just moved here. I'm still learning where the store where things are in the store, and they say, why did you move to Muncie? <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of some of the difficulties Muncie has been having, but that's always the first question. People say, why would you move here? Well, I tell them, we're planning a church. My husband's a pastor. We're planning a church. We're excited to see what God's going to do. And then you continue that conversation based on the reactions. People usually want to either tell you about all the problems Muncie has, or they want to share a need with you. And it's very cool to see how God is working, even before we're having services, how God is working to draw people both to the church and to him. So our other main job is raising support. And that's prayer support, that's people support, that's financial support. I want to ask you, as you think of us, from the bottom of my heart, would you pray for us? Because we know that unless God works, we have no power to go do what we're doing. We need a movement of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, as we just heard, God can make such a difference. When you look at those whom you've, you've grown up with or friends or family that don't know Christ, you know what a difference Christ makes, and it's only by his power that we're going to be doing what we're doing. So I want to ask you to pray for us. If you could join us with any skills or abilities you have, that would be wonderful. And I want to leave you with a story. We've got... A little guy, a neighbor of ours that's been playing with our kids, and he ran into the house the other day, um, and he was waiting for one of our sons who was still doing his homework, and he ran up to Michael and he said, hey, I heard you're a pastor. And Michael said, yeah, I am. And he said, could you pray for me? And that's not a request that you normally hear from like an eight-year-old kid running into the house. It's not something that's first on their lips. And he started to share that his father had passed away just a few months ago. And his mother is battling an addiction, and he's living with family, and he wanted prayer. So as Michael's praying for him, you could tell this little guy was just so touched because someone was taking the time to take his needs to God. People hadn't done that for him before. And you know, God has those kind of people in your life all over the place. It's figuring out who they are, and getting into a relationship with them that you're in a place to introduce them to their Savior. We're on a mission in Muncie where there's over 80,000 people that need to know Christ. But, you know, I looked up the stats for Grant County. Your percentages are way better, but there's still 42,000 people in Grant County that claim no religious affiliation whatsoever. 
So we're all on a mission, right? We're all on a mission together. Pastor Michael's going to tell you what God says about the mission that we're on. One night, a wife found her husband standing over their newborn crib. As she watched her husband looking down at their very first baby, she saw on his face a mixture of emotions. She saw disbelief, amazement, curiosity, excitement, skepticism, delight, doubt. Touched by the unusual display of deep emotions coming from her husband, she quietly walked up as the, the baby had slept behind her husband and took her hand and kind of put it around his waist. And she whispered, what you thinking? What you thinking? As the husband stood there, he kind of let out a sigh and had a smirk on his face. And he said, I just don't see how they can make this great of a baby crib for only $89.99. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's just how sometimes a guy can see things or how we see things. But sometimes perhaps I think it's how the church can kind of get sidetracked in seeing things. Many times we miss the very miracle that's right in front of our face. We miss the opportunity. We miss that moment. We miss that miracle because we aren't looking where we need to be. I mean, the point is the greatest miracle of God's creation was right there in front of them, and they just missed it. As believers, as Christians, we do what we do because of who and what God has called us to be. I mean, just think about it. A, a, a beautician, when they look at people, what are they looking at? They're, they're looking at your hair. Very good friends of ours, she's a beautician, and she does an amazing job with hair, and it's funny because I can spend time with her as our uh, family's out at ball games and our kids are you know, and the same teams and, and that in the past, and she'd be just looking at people. I could just tell just looking at, oh, I could do this with her hair and that with his, and I could just do a little updo and a little color there, and oh, it'd just be amazing. I mean, as a beautician, she's always looking at hair uh, or a, a nail technician, right? What are they always looking at? They're looking at your nails and your cuticles, and they're like, man, just give me your hands for 15 minutes. I could just make you a new person, right? Or, or uh, somebody that, that, that does your feet, you know? Um, what, do you, what do you call them? What do you call them? There's like, yeah, Jeff. Jeff goes and see those people, right? You know, you know yeah, you know what they're about. You know what they're called. Uh, yeah, pedicurists. They're, they're looking at your feet and getting ready to get out the grinders and sanders and buffers and all that other stuff that they do. Or somebody that shines your shoes. They're looking at your shoes. I'll never forget one time. I was in Chicago, I was walking the Miracle Mile, Michigan Avenue, and this guy said, hey, you want a free shoe shine? Now, this was back when I was in college, and I remember I was wearing my favorite shoes. They were, they were Timberlands. And, you know, they're kind of expensive because they have leather on them. This is when they first kind of came out. They, were just a, they weren't like the Dockers one, but they had the little bit higher heel, you know. And, and I'm like, man, I, yeah, I've had them a year. I, they could use a nice shoe shine. And so I said, sure. So I walked up to the guy, and he just starts buffing and snapping that cloth and putting his little lick em, stick em on it. And, man, he got done with that shoe, and I looked down, and it looked great. And he says, what do you think? I'm like, ah, that looks amazing. And I'm like, ah, a free shoe shine. The other one cost me $15. <laughs> Yeah, he got me. He got me good. But he was looking. He was looking right for that person that would have shoes like mine that would make one so shiny looking new and the other one would be so bad you just had to pay for the other one. I mean, or that person that maybe, uh, you know, roughs, right? They're, they're always looking at the condition of shingles. I mean, what? think about it. What you do causes you to see what you see. 
And as a believer in Christ, we should be seeing the world a whole lot differently as believers. As Savior, what does a Savior see? A Savior sees sinners. A person that loves missions sees souls. As Christians, we're to be salt and light. We're to bring light into dark places. We have the cure, and that cure is Jesus. So let me ask you, how do you see discipleship and reaching people for Christ? How do you see that? Charles Spurgeon said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. I like that. Of course, the problem, the uneasiness about that is there's no alternative. I mean, you are either a missionary or you're an imposter. God has given each one of us, you and me, a mission to reach people for Christ and teach them how to become more like him. Disciples that make disciples. But this morning, this, this message really has only two points. I know there should be three, so, you know, don't blow a gasket. You know, this pastor's going to just do a two-point message today. But I'm, I'm doing that because I, I, my prayer is, is that we can really take hold of this and be better for what we hear. So first point, we really have two simultaneous missions going on that really are hand in hand. Our first, I guess I just want to talk about the first mission I want to talk about is reaching people for Jesus. It's the word that, I wish there was a different word for it, but I can't think of it, but evangelism. It's, 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 it's doing life together. It's reaching people for Jesus. But unfortunately, many people in the church, they think that this mission or, or the program that we have to build, it's, it's for the green berets of the church. I mean, someone tell me for a moment, how did we create a culture in the church where we come to church one time a week, some less than that, and then when we leave, nothing changes? I mean, this isn't the Bible. This isn't what we read. I mean, as believers in Christ, we cannot pass the buck on to someone else. Why? It's because you might just be the only Jesus that person may know. In my living room, when my heart broke, and it still does, even as Kim told that story, that little guy, we, our family might be the only Jesus that, that he ever knows. I think, I believe we are living in desperate times, and people are desperate. People like that little guy need prayer. Your neighbors need prayer. Yeah, even the ones you can't get along with because they mow the wrong side of the, your grass or whatever it is, or your, their dogs, you know, doing something in what should be done in their yard, not yours. People need Jesus. This is paramount. And the opportunity before you is extremely significant. Some of you, you, you already know. You know what I'm talking about because you have been praying for the salvation of that family member or that friend or that neighbor for a very long time. And there are days where you just feel like giving up. Let me tell you, do not give up. Dig in deeper. Continue praying. God does his best work, I believe, when we're on our knees sometimes. One of those families that came to join us and planning a church he, he gets us because he told me 38 years they're praying for a salvation of a family member i'm telling you do not stop you got to remember god what he's really good at is rescuing people amen it's what he's good at but we need to be on our knees praying luke 19 10 says this for the son of man came to seek and what Save the lost. Right there as Christians, this is, this is our rallying cry. And just like Jesus, we are to seek and save the lost. The church right here, it, it doesn't exist for us. The moment that we start thinking the church exists for us, we might as well just turn, you might as well just turn your back on the 40-some thousand people in Grand, 
county and tell them just to go to hell because it's, we're doing the things that we like here and the things that's important to us and the things that we feel good and the music that we like. And once we start down that path, it's like an ingrown toenail. It, it's okay at first, but after a while, i got to rip that sucker off for it to grow again. Unfortunately, some churches don't have that opportunity. I mean, they die out. It's our rallying cry. Jesus was so adamant about this. This is a verse very familiar to you. It's even on your website. He, he gave it to us as a commandment. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, time out right there because some of you you've heard this verse before and you're like well I haven't baptized anybody you're like man I, I don't know about that I mean that's for the pastor I don't have a seminary degree I, I don't have those people skills I mean remember God uses everyone especially those that don't feel e equipped excuses do not apply I mean just try telling that to Moses <laughs> you want to reach someone for Christ you already have the answer. What's that answer? It's your story. The greatest thing, the greatest tool that you can reach somebody for Christ is just simply asking them what their story is, sharing your story, find out what is in common, and saying, hey, would you like to, to go on an adventure with me? Would you, would you like to know what, what, what God really offers us? You know, what's, what's interesting about this is uh, in learning people's story and sharing yours, is it, it leads me to my next point. Our, our mission is making disciples. It's teaching people how to become more like Jesus. I mean, think about it. When you think about it, Jesus never asked anyone to be a Christian. Did he? He, didn't, he didn't ask anybody. Hey, why don't you come be a Christian? No, in his language, he asked them to be something else. Jesus called people to be his disciple. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. Let's, let's look at that together. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Now, Matthew, this tax collector, I mean, people despise tax collectors. Why? I mean, they're next to criminals. Some people even call them criminals. Why? They're taking more than, than what they should. And Jesus said to Matthew, this guy that literally people didn't want really to do anything with or have anything in common about it. Jesus said follow me I mean notice what he didn't say he didn't say hey I want you to believe like I believe but no he said follow me and be my what somebody tell me my disciple so Jesus said this to him and Matthew what did he do he got up and he followed him everybody said say follow him I mean, think about it. Jesus didn't say, hey, why don't you come to my church? Walk like I do. Talk like I do. No, he said, would you be my disciple? Now, that begs the question, okay, what does disciple really mean? Well, in the Greek, the disciple, this word disciple literally means to be a learner or a student or a pupil, or it means to be a follower. I mean, I love this about Jesus because he said, hey, I'm not calling you to be a Christian. He said, be my student, be, be a learner, be a disciple. You know, one of the things that people say, oh, well, what happens if I don't have all the answers? <laughs> and sometimes we think, oh, well, I don't have all the answers. We'll just let Pastor Jeff and everybody else, you know, just share cards because I can't. You no, know, this, this is great. D did you miss it? Because being a disciple means being a learner. Like, man, that's a great question. I don't know the answer about that. But you know what? That's okay, because Jesus already knows us anyways. We get to learn together. We get to do life together. It's like this is just how God has, has ordained it. It's called church family. There's nothing better than having church family. And your church family is the most important family you can ever have. Why? It's because you're taking them with, with you, right? Eternally. I mean, I love my brother. I'm real close to my brother, but he lives down in Atlanta. If I want a cheeseburger and don't have five bucks, he can't send it to me that day. But hey... As family, right, we can have refrigerator rights with one another. I can hit up a church family member, walk into their kitchen and say, hey, I'm just fixing myself a sandwich.
We do life together. It's interesting because when you're planning a church, it's, it's I mean, isn't this boring? Hey, will you come join my church? Like, doesn't that sound boring? Like, join my church. No, I, I'm not asking anybody to join my church. I can't think of anything more boring and mundane. It's like, well, if I visit like nine times, is it like the tenth time free, or do I get like some like knife set with that, or how does that? I mean, it's just like join my church, like the YMC. Like, no, no. What I love about the mission that God gives us is it's a movement. It is. And if you do a study on movements, movements is just created with a small group of people. Holy cow, what could God do with just this small group here today and first service? You combine all that, you do stuff like the big give and, and people have like, you know, 300 bowls of soup or whatever it is. And, and you just, just love on people. That changes communities. Communities, right? They, they, they change cities. Cities change. I mean, you guys, I mean, it's really, I, I got to tell you, it's just, thank you for the blessing that you have given our family this morning in worship, in your hospitality. I'm telling you, you're on to something, but I want to encourage you to dig deeper. Students, up in the balcony, man, that's you. That's in school, man. Like, how are you going to be light into your school this week? How are you going to let prayer change things? You know, as I think about starting this new church, I love it because at times we don't know what we're doing. But it's an opportunity to say, you know what, we're going we're to find out. It's crazy what God has been doing and how he's been drawing people to Muncie's newest church. Jesus didn't call us to be some part of some organization or some system or to follow these sets of rules. No, he's like, hey, I've got something for you. I, 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 want, you, I want you to love like I love. I want you to, to live like I live. I want you to do as I do. Follow me. Let's go change the world. I got to tell you, that just takes the hair on my arms and just puts it right up in the air when I think about the opportunity to do this we're, we're living out Acts 2 right praying together fellowshipping together being devoted to one another in prayer watching God meet needs and this is such an important thing I, I gotta tell you it's true you know, in that row, middle row, there's six kids there. Like, sometimes in your past six kids, you, you just forget things. Or sometimes you miss things. I'll never forget one time I was going to church, looked in the rearview mirror, and I went, one, two, three, four, five, six, great. We got them all. Let's go to church. For, we, we, you know, I can't be late. You know, we got to dial in. I get to church. We all unpack. We unload. Somebody goes, Dad, where's Andrew? I'm like, he was in the back. I counted him. No, you counted the neighbor kid. I was like, Oh, no, I counted the wrong six. He's still at home. Literally, I left my kid at home from church. Who does that? Like, what pastor leaves with no kid? But I did. It's true. I've left church before, and he's still at back. We're at Taco Bell eating. Somebody's like, that's all right. I got him. You know, the church family, like, hey, that's, we, we, we just, you know, you, we miss things. You have a flat tire. Who come? It's church family. Something's leaking at the house. Man, that's my church family. I'm telling you, Pastor Jeff, he needs you. And guess what? You need Pastor Jeff. And guess what, Fairmont Congregation? You need one another. Like, that, that, that's, that's the secret sauce. That's what being a disciple is about. Learn. Do life together. Reach people that don't know him. And the fun part is, is when people don't know Jesus, right? And they come in and find out that sometimes you're more messed up than they are. Right? They're like, really, you went through that? Like some of you, 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 you carry with you some pretty deep scars. I get that. Some of you, you've walked and traveled that road of divorce. Praise the Lord. My wife and I, we've been married for 22 plus years. We've never walked that road. Now, I, I can bring somebody God's word. I can bring... And, and, and show people in his word God's faithfulness and how he can heal and how he can do that. But I, I can't walk and talk through that conversation like many of you have, have experienced God's grace through that. 
And so when we come together as a church family or students, some of you, you have students, you, you know at school, they're right in the thick of it right now. They've been through that, and they're going through that, and they think it's all their fault. And you can say, you know what, my mom and dad went through that years ago. Let me, let me tell you what Jesus did through that. That's the beauty of the church, right? But if we're not out there sharing our lives with one another, being salt and light, I mean, it's hopelessness. You, you might as well forget the big gift, just send them the card that says go to hell because we stopped being about the very thing that Jesus was about, and that was to seek and save the lost. I want to encourage you. I, I hear this a lot in churches. I, I hear all the time, well, it's my personal relationship. It's my personal relationship. Don't stop at a personal relationship because it's personal and shared. Your relationship with Christ should always be personal, yes, but shared. Don't forget that. I mean, you're not just a Christian and, you know, whatever that means to the world, but you are his disciple. You, you live like Jesus lives. You love like he loves. You do what he did because your life is not your own. You were bought with a price. You are a disciple of of the living Lord Jesus Christ. I want to wrap up by kind of sharing two stories because sometimes often as Christians, we just do a good job and sometimes it can annoy others by just being nice. We're just nice all the time. We're nice. I mean, we know Jesus is in us and we're just nice, 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 nice. But you know, I know a lot of nice people. Even this past Friday, a woman in her 80s, she says, Michael, there's a friend of mine, she's dying. We're close friends. She said she was saved as a little girl, but she's never went to church. You can't see any light from her life. She doesn't want to hear scripture. She doesn't want to hear anything. What do I say to her? What do I do? And I said, well, Stella, it's, it's, it's time for you to kind of have a little meet with Jesus conversation with her. She goes, yeah, but what do I say to somebody like that? I says, well, I said, make it personal. She says, what do you mean, make it personal? I said, just go on. I, I, and there have been other pastors that have went to see her. I said, maybe, maybe you need to say, you know, you just, I cannot imagine going to heaven and getting there and not seeing you there. So I'm going to be selfish for a minute. I said, why don't you be selfish for a minute? Just say, I need you to really think about this because as your friend, I want this relationship to be forever. I mean, just think about it for a moment. Even Jesus, all the miracles that he did, all the life that he did together, like the disciples, they, they were freaking out, but every single one of them, except for one, were martyred by their faith. I mean, you would think if you saw a miracle like water into wine or, you know, the loaves and fish, I mean, all that multiplied and and and. and, and People that couldn't see, I mean, healed and the lame walk, you would think, okay, I'm following that person. Like, yes, I did life. I'm fine. But they were ready to run, right? They were ready to bolt. Why did they why did they get martyred? It's because of the relationship that Jesus had with a ministry. Discipleship is relationships. And for some of us here today, it's time to ask that person to say, Hey, what do you think? What do you think about what God did for you and Jesus did for you? I'll never forget. My dad, I was a young kid, and we loved this as boys, and we would go and um, check out the new cars. Any of you like checking out new cars, getting the free ride? Well, we got done that night, and my dad said, what do you think, boys? What do you think about the car? And my brother and I were like, oh, it's great, and all these new buttons, and oh, this is fast, and we got to get this one. And he says, well, and I'll never forget what he said. It, it was profound. He said, there was something the car salesman did not do. He failed to do his job. And we're like, what do you mean he failed to do his job? We just got the free car right out of it, and we might buy the car. He says, no, the salesman never asked if I wanted to buy the car. So many times as Christians, we can be just nice for so long and so long, but we never give the reason for why we believe. As we ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us, there are some of you right now that are probably being convicted. It is time for you to have that meet with Jesus conversation. Be praying for those opportunities. You never know when they may come. 
How many of y'all been to Cedar Point? Last story of the day, and I land the plane. Yeah, a lot of hands. So this is the world's, they, they, they coined themselves, the world's greatest roller coaster park in the world. And I got to admit, their roller coasters are pretty awesome. Years ago, I'll never forget, the Millennium Force just opened in Cedar Point. It was like the highest, the fastest, the most amazing thing. And like every good youth pastor does, I had l- lost my entire youth group in the park. But I was on the millennium first. Don't worry, don't worry. They were with leaders. It was cool. Everything was all right. But here I am. I'm ready to go on the millennium force, front car, hands up. I mean, I am stoked for this thing. One hour passes in the line, two hour passes in the line. I don't care because I'm riding a millennium force, front car. And what's interesting, when you go to Cedar Point, you start to hear the stories of the people that are in front or behind you. And there was that day, there was two girl uh, teenagers that were right in front of me. And these girls are just like, I don't know. Do you think we'll do it? I don't know. We could die. Like, it's pretty scary. Oh, it's going to be awesome. You know, and and they would just go back and forth between how awesome it was going to be and then how they're going to die and back and forth. Well, as they went back and forth and back and forth, and, and you know, you get closer and closer, and then you really realize how, like, huge this roller coaster is. And at this point, we literally, we had got up the stairs, and the girl said to her, after two and a half hours in the line, the girl says to her friend, she says, I'm bouncing. I'm out of here. I'm bailing. I can't do this. I will die. And she turned around and left her friend. And her friend was like, no, you can't do this to me. I can't do this alone. As Christians, that's very profound. Because that girl was right. We can't do this alone. God never give us, gave us our lives to live alone. It's been meant to live in fellowship with him and with others. It's family. And as I heard her say this, I can't do this alone, I, I said to her, I said, man, your friend just left you. That really sucks. <laughs> I said, do you, do you want to ride together? And she says, Yeah. I said, okay, good. Because I said, I don't want to do this alone either. And then I said to her, I said, you know, and, and literally there's one person ahead of us. And I said, what happens if we do die? <laughs> I'm like, I'm serious. She says, that's just it. I, I have no idea. And right then, in there, before the next car came, God gave me the opportunity to share the gift of salvation and the gospel with her. And right there before the millennium force, she accepted Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Can we give a hand for that? Praise God for that. There are people all around us They might not be getting ready to ride a roller coaster, but you know what? They have been on the roller coaster of life, and there's no thrill because there's no eternal hope. And you have the cure. You have that answer. And people of Fairmont Wesleyan Church, God has given you and me and us a command to go and make disciples. I beg you, I implore you, share your story. Because that neighborhood kid that might be eight years old might be needing you to pray for them. You just haven't asked him yet. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're on a mission, people. So let's go and make disciples. Why don't you stand with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. 
thank you for your sacrifice. God, I pray a blessing that you would just pour out in abundance to each and every person here. God, give them the courage to stand up for you, to be a light, wherever that means, whether it's in a work or at home or in a school, whether that's in a marriage. God, you, <laughs> you're in the business of rescuing us. And I don't know, Lord, maybe right now we need a rescue. We need a rescue. We need a rescue in our job. We need a rescue in our marriage. We need a res rescue in our relationships. Or God, I don't know, maybe there's someone here that just says, you know, I, I've been living life my own, and I'm tired. I'm beat up. God, you gave your life for us, and maybe it's just now time for us to say, God, now you can have mine. So with every head bowed and eyes closed, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's you. Is, this, is that you just saying, you know, I, I just need Jesus. I need him as my personal Savior. I've never, I, I don't know if I've ever really can say I'm a, I'm a Christ follower. But maybe today is your day. If so, I'd ask you just to slip up your hand and say, yeah, I, I need to do that. Or maybe, maybe you're the type of person today that says, man, I just need to get back on track. I need to get back on track because there's friends of mine that, that, that don't know the plan of salvation. And I know that God is sending me to tell them. And quite frankly, that's every one of us here. So Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, God, I pray that you would just send us. God, allow us to pray a dangerous prayer this morning to say, here I am, send me, send me. And God, the truth is, you've already sent us into the places we're already going, whether it's our work or school or in our, in our neighborhood. God, you've already sent us to that place. Or God, I don't know, maybe you might be sending us somewhere else. God, maybe you might be calling someone here to be that next missionary that this church supports. Maybe there's someone here that, that they have, they're getting a call to ministry. They're feeling, God, just your, your, your call here this morning. And God, whatever that may be, God, we say, here I am, send me. God, use me. It's the most dangerous prayer we can pray this morning. But please, don't say amen to that if you're not ready to say, here I am, send me. God, use me. Because I just want to tell you, people of God, if you pray this prayer, God is going to take you up on it. And who knows? He might just change the world. He might just change a relationship through saying, here I am, send me. So, God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this church. God, I pray that you would allow us just to continue just to bless this community with big gifts. God, let that start first in our home and then with others as we live like you live and join a movement of believers that God, not even the gates of hell, can prevail against. God, we love you. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' living name that we pray. And everyone said, here it is. Say it like you mean it. Amen. It has been a privilege and blessing uh, for my family and I being with you. And I know for those that are about, you know, to call Muncie's newest church their home. So thank you, Bradford's and David and Love Family and, and Costello's. Um, so here it is. Go be Jesus' hands and his feet. Go be that disciple. Go make disciples that make disciples. You're dismissed. Have a great day.